Hi, everyone. This is Dee Marley with the History Bards podcast. Today, we have the great privilege of welcoming Rose Gonsolin to the show today. Rose lives in the Sonoran Desert with, oh my goodness, with scorpions, javelinas. What is that? What is javelinas? They're they're like, they're wild pigs and they oh, just, okay. come, they come around all the time and <laughs> they create havoc in our yard. Oh my goodness. Well, including with that, with the snakes and the bobcats, you live in a wild country. <laughs> And in a nature preserve. <laughs> okay, wow. Well, she says she shares a home with Chloe, Lucy, and the weasel. You're going to have to tell us about that. <laughs> and she is currently working on an epistolary novel about sisters living in London, Portugal, and the Americas during the War of 1812. That is so exciting. So we're going to really get into the um, interview today and including the bio that I just kind of told our listeners about. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and your journey as a writer? Yes. I early on decided I was not going to be a writer because there were <laughs> really good books out there. I was never going to be able to write something better than Steinbeck or Faulkner. And then it just, the stories wouldn't go away. So I finally had to just decide I'm going to do it. Um, and you know, it's been a journey. I think anything that you really work at, you get better at over time. Yeah. Yes. And so this last book has been particularly satisfying and rewarding from that standpoint. Um, I'm glad I did two other novels before, because I think this one I was able to finally kind of get everything together structure wise and pacing and, and the character arc. And the research was so much fun. I mean, I just had a great time doing it. And the way it kind of started is I'm originally from Houston. I was born and raised there, mm -hmm. but we are not, we were not taught anything about his life when I was growing up. We just oh. knew he was the Battle of San Jacinto. And then later you learn that he was a big drunk. And so we didn't know anything about him. And I was actually living in West Hartford, Connecticut. And I picked up a biography of him. And I remember picking it up and looking at the cover. And I thought, hmm, I don't know anything about Sam Houston. So I bought it. And I mean, within the first 25 pages, I was kind of mad because okay. his life, his early life is so exciting. I mean, he runs away and lives with the Cherokee. He teaches school after he's never even really spent any time in a schoolhouse. And then he almost dies um, in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend under Andrew Jackson. And then he goes on to be a congressman, a governor, his yes. life falls apart. And all this amazing stuff happens before he ever even gets to Texas. Right. So that's what inspired me because the more that I learned about him, I just felt like I had been denied mm -hmm. essential knowledge since I'm a Houstonian right. by the education system. So that's why I wrote the book. I wrote it for my 14-year-old self who would have wanted to read this when I was like in eighth or ninth grade. So is your target audience more in for that or is it for like from that age to adult? That age to adult. Okay. Um, I think it's mostly adults who've read it based on the reviews that I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, but my hope is that it gets to be part of particularly the Texas curriculum. Yeah. It was so instrumental in the whole history of the country, I mean, if it hadn't have been for Sam Houston, the Battle of San Jacinto, where Texas, the Texians defeated Santa Ana, would not have happened. And then that was the domino that led to the entire American Southwest becoming part, part of the United States. So why he's overlooked, I still am coming to understand that yeah yeah he was a well, that makes sense. he was a polarizing figure a lot of people I think when you met him you either loved him or hated him and he had this big magnetic personality and he was a politician and he had a lot of flaws but when you look at his influence on our history one of the things that was really exciting to me 
is as I was doing the research about his time with the Cherokees, he had written a letter later in life, but I used it, where he basically explained that when he was growing up, he'd been taught to hate people that he didn't even know. And then when he went to live among the Cherokee, they were so welcoming to him. They really gave him that confidence and that um, recognition and acceptance that he hadn't really found with his own family. Right. And so that was very powerful to hear in his own words, recognizing that when you're growing up, you can have hatred instilled in you that is not justified. Yeah. And it can be, and I think that was a fundamental life lesson for him that he used throughout his entire life because he always stood up for not only the Cherokee, but recognizing the dignity and the presence of the people that were here before the Europeans came. Right, right. Well, that's really fascinating. We actually just published um, Yellowbird Song, which kind of goes in the same kind of um, uh, vein about the, the Cherokee Indians and the Trail of Tears. And how, that's kind of a very um, sad time in American history. And um, so for, for listeners out there who really like that kind of that genre and that era, this is a really good one to, can you tell our listeners the title and, and a, a little bit more about the premise of the book? Yes, the title is When the Grass is Rising, A Portrait of Young Sam Houston. And the premise of the book is just to really give life to those years that all the major biographers weren't able to do much with. Right. And I think that's the power of historical fiction. It is. Because when I had to do this deep dive on the research, I actually discovered that the historians and the biographers had gotten the birth order of the four oldest sons wrong. Wow. And I discovered it by going up to Lexington, Virginia, where he was born in that area, and I pulled the will and the inventory of his father and then I did the same thing for his maternal grandfather. And I realized that the historians had thought that Paxton was the oldest son, but he was not. He was the, the fourth son. So mm -hmm. that gave me that family dynamic. And then I found all these other fascinating things like when Sam's father, a couple of years before he died, he got into a lawsuit with some neighbors because he had yanked a young girl in the church, the meeting house, out of Sunday meeting because she was doing, you know, like talking in tongues and uh -huh. like they were called the jerkers back then. Uh -huh. The other great resource was I had gone to Georgia and I met with Jeff Bishop, who is the director of the Funk Heritage Center. And he told me to get a copy of the Journal of John Norton. And John Norton was a half Cherokee man who had been actually uh, born in Britain, but his father had been full Cherokee and he decided to come back and meet his father's ancestors. So mm -hmm. he traveled in the Cherokee territory from 1809 to 1810. And this is exactly the same time that Sam Houston was there. Oh, wow. So, it was like a gift. It was yes. like, and I was able to read, and John Norton was a tremendous writer and he kept very detailed notes, not only about the landscape, but what were, he would go to the, the Cherokee councils. Mm -hmm. And so he would document what people were talking about, which chief was saying what, and how they really looked at the coming encroachment by the Europeans, the, you know, the whites. And it was funny because it was not a monolithic thing. There were some Cherokee that said, maybe we should just sell this stuff to them because at least we'll get some money out of them because they're just going to take it anyway. Mm -hmm. And then others were saying, no, we don't want to move. This is our ancestral home. Yeah. And the West was actually perceived as the land of the dead. So they particularly didn't want to go West. But then because of infighting and people signing treaties that they weren't authorized, the Cherokee, 
they, some of them had to move to Arkansas because they were in fear of their lives because they had signed away treaties, maybe gotten bribes, and they were afraid that they were going to get retribution right. because, um, so all of this, it just showed that it was not a period where everybody thought the same way, whether it exactly. was no matter what culture you came from. And that's what I like about historical fiction is you can actually show through the eyes of the people what was really going on. Mm -hmm. And I had an, a, an editor who first read the early manuscript and she critiqued me because I didn't tell her that it was the War of 1812. And so I thinking to myself, well, they didn't know it was the War of 1812. That's right. much, much later. So I realized I was not the right editor for this book. <laughs> no. no, that's a good point. <laughs> Finding the right editor is very critical. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you feel like in, in all of your research and, and, and the premise of this book, and you were just talking a little bit about how historical fiction does that, about teaching lessons and everything. How do you, how do you feel like that that could um, benefit audiences for today? I think it could give audiences that sense of everything's not black and white mm -hmm. because it, it does deal with slavery because Sam's family did have slaves, but they didn't really have many and I did find some letters in uh, Rice University in their um, archives area. And it's funny because Sam's youngest sister, who was still living in Tennessee when he was out in, ten in Texas, she wrote to him about how Granny Peg was still around and she was taking care of her. And so they, the Shenandoah Valley, which is where they came from, they were not like the East... Uh, you know, the Eastern seaboard where you would have plantations that had hundreds of enslaved peoples. The Shenandoah Valley, if they had one, normally it was two or three. And while they, they were slaves, it was not that same culture. And so at one point I have Sam's mother explain to somebody that, you know, who's, they want her to free Granny Peg. And she says, why would I send her away from everyone who she feels is family? Why would I send her someplace where she can't be protected? I didn't make these rules, but I'm going to take care of the people that are close to me. And mm. I think that's an important message that not everyone treated their, not people were born into a system that they didn't necessarily agree with, but there were no simple answers back then when it came to individuals. Yes. Yeah, that, that is a very, very good point. Um, and as far as research goes, because I know like all of us historical fiction authors, we can really get immersed in our research. <laughs> so what kind of advice would you give someone starting out about trying to get into historical fiction? I would say try to find as many source documents as you can. Yes. Letters, wills, inventories, um, you know, going on and doing like when I first started, I would just Google Sam Houston's name. I couldn't believe how many times some of his third and fourth cousins would come up. <laughs> and, and his it was his second cousin that wrote the biographical account, uh, like a genealogy, like a family tree of the Houston family. Well, he's the one that got it wrong. And because he really wasn't around. And so you can go and you can look at family trees and you can look on ancestry, but it's source documents that really can give you the true story. And it was amazing to me at how much they propelled the story for me mm -hmm. because I would get stuck and not know, you know, I knew Sam did something, but I didn't know why he did it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know exactly when he did it. And so going back and really looking at the particular things like one thing that was really exciting to me, and it may not sound exciting, I actually got a hold of some of the original, probably the original first signature of Sam. And it was over like a two or three month period. And it was the period right before he ran away to live with the Cherokee. And you can literally see the evolution of his signature because it starts oh, out, wow. you know, he he's Samuel, but it's abbreviated. And then at the end, it's a big Sam with a big swirl underneath it. 
-hmm. and because what he was doing is he was working in a trade store in uh, Southwest Point and he would uh, witness notes where people would come in and they were borrow $2 and 50 cents and he would be a witness to it. And mm -hmm. so his signature goes over like a three, four month period. You can see the development of him as a person yeah. through his signature. I mean, I think that's very vital. It's not at all boring because it's like, you know, people say can say a lot or learn a lot from people's signatures. So I think that's really fascinating that you found that. Finding those little tidbits like that in, in your research and all is really fascinating, isn't it? It was thrilling. I mean, I was <laughs> so excited. And the other thing, too, is how I would find them had significance to me because there were many times where I would get stuck and I just felt like I had a guiding hand that would say, no, go back and look at that. Um, dig a little deeper. And so I'd go back to some of the biographies. I'd look in the notes. I'd look in the bibliography. And I'd try to track down little things that would just help me put him in a place at a point in time with a mindset. Um, because you can know that somebody ran away and they can sort of tell you why. But what was that moment that he decided, no, I'm getting out of here? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You really want to know that. I mean, that's that's yeah. that's very intriguing why somebody would want to do that. And uh, so, well, that's really all of this is incredibly fascinating. But I have to ask you this, because you said that earlier that you didn't want to be a writer, but you just felt like the stories were just kept kept being there and everything. So what do you feel like has been your um, like influence as far as um, maybe um, books that you've read or authors that you really admire? Yeah, I I fell in love with My Antonia by Willa Cather. I mean, she, that was so good, and it was such a big deal for me, and I've read almost everything that she's written. Not all of her work is that good. Um, I love Colleen McCullough. Yes. He wrote the Masters of Rome series. Yeah. It was another experience where you felt like, well, I never knew any of, I didn't, understand it because I didn't understand the people behind it. Mm -hmm. Whereas like I'm watching the PBS show on Caesar right now and they take a decidedly different, uh, they have a different take on Caesar than Colleen McCullough. So the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, no, he was much <laughs> better. Why do I say all these negative things about him? Uh, and I think the other one that really influenced me was reading The Killing Angels um, about this, the Battle of Gettysburg. That was also a book that I read in college. And I felt like for the first time, I really understood why the Civil War happened. Before oh, wow. I tell you, but knowing the people behind it and knowing, I mean, that was just a phenomenal historical fiction book. And that's like, to me, that's the standard of which you try to apply to. Yeah. And I think we all have those. And don't you think that it's really vital for um, like younger authors or ones who are starting out to be able to kind of um, use that as a, not necessarily as a template, but as a, you know, as a, a touchstone, you know? Yeah. For your, yeah. Yes. Because what, what I remember, I, I read a book by George Garrett years and years ago, and I was on an airplane and he's talking about um, Queen Elizabeth banishing, and now the name escapes me, uh, you know, this man who had gotten, he's the, he was the whole character of the book. But anyway, she banishes him from court, but he was kind of happy about it because court was boring and it was a lot of pressure. And so he was really kind of happy. Well, that made her matter because <laughs> he didn't care. And those behind the scenes, behind the eyes moments where you realize people's motivation yeah. and you really connect to human character and human nature. Yeah. Yeah. That to me is what I try to, to do in my own writing where people have that sort of visceral experience where, yeah, I felt that way too. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the beauties of, of historical fiction is that it connects people throughout time, throughout eras and, and uh, it's it's um, it can be so rich, like you were saying, the the wording and the history 
all of it mingled together just makes historical fiction just to me one of the best of course I'm, I'm going to feel that way the best genre for people to be able to read <laughs> too and I like to read a lot of history as well yeah and I think there's another character out there I'm not going to do it but I wish somebody would write a really good historical fiction on Peter the Great. I just read oh. a biography. I talk about another fascinating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and just the whole idea that he would go incognito to Europe and pretend that he's not the king of Russia. I mean, it was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, there's so many, there's so many stories like that that have yet to be told. And that's the reason why historical fiction can just keep going on and on because um, you're always going to find those obscure stories that nobody has told yet. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so I, it's important okay. for teachers too because yes. you can teach historical fiction, but if you just point students in the right direction and yes. give them options for reading, then history can come alive for you. Absolutely. It does. It does. I, I was fortunate to have some teachers like that. So uh, it kind of set me on that path. So t tell us um, what's coming up next. Like, what are you, are you working on anything? Yes, I'm working on actually two different pieces. One is more like a novella story and it's got a little bit of time travel, but it's set July 1789 in Paris when Thomas Jefferson was there. Oh, he decide was there too and so it's and I'm, I'm just still working that one through and then my next project for a full-blown novel is going to be letters between sisters and so what I'm reading for research right now is um, letters between six sisters the Mitford uh, sisters and that's really interesting just to hear about how or see how they dealt with each other and how they got information across. Because when you write letters, you're very restricted. I mean, you can't say, you know, you can't give any narrative that describes the setting. You really have to get it all through um, someone communicating on paper. And so that's going to be a challenge, but I'm looking forward to maybe getting to uh, Paris and, yeah, uh, and I just haven't uh, spent the time to try to make that happen yet. Uh, well, and you've never been before? I've been to Paris, but I have not been to London. And the other okay. place I really want to go to is Lyon, France, uh, because part of this is going to be around uh, clothing and fabrics. And there's a big museum in Lyon. It's closed right now, but it's the Muse Museo de Tissues. And it's like one of the best fabric museums in the in the in Europe. Well, this sounds really fascinating. I'm sure your fans are gonna be like biting the bit trying to for you to get that one out. That sounds really fascinating. And and the the um traveling to places, I know I've talked about that before in the podcast, about traveling to the places that you're that you're writing about is it, such an incredible experience to be able to walk in their footsteps. Yeah, and I think it makes a huge difference because you meet people, like I went to the Sam Houston Schoolhouse, which is just outside of Maryville, Murrayville, Tennessee, and I met the director who had been there for a long time, and we probably sat and talked for an hour, and she told me little tidbits of things, and she also, they gave me a map of the farmstead that was... Um, where Elizabeth Houston took her children after their father died. So I was able to go up and see the landscape, see the area, and then you can describe it with a, sort of, a certain amount of confidence of that you don't have to worry about like, what was this, what was that? You went there, you saw it, you took pictures, and now you can just go about describing it. And it, to me, it made it more real and it grounded me. Yes, it definitely does. So, Rose, can you tell our listeners um, where they can, where people can go and find out more about your books? Yes, it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble as well. It's in some museums for sale. And um, for booksellers, it's available on uh, Ingram Spark. Okay. And uh, you, do you have a website? I do not right now. Okay. All right, that's fine. So, please... 
everyone listening, please go out and check out those um, different venues that Rose mentioned and get this fascinating book about a time in American history, um, Sam Houston and the, and the American Indians and all of that. I think it's a really fascinating era to talk about. Uh, we really appreciate you being on the show today, Rose. Well, thank you. I'm so excited to talk about it. I just could go on and on, and my family's really glad I wrote this book, and I don't have to keep bothering them about it. <laughs> yeah, I think we all experience that. <laughs> well, whenever your next book comes out, the one, the time travel one, and also the one about the letters, please let us know, and we would love to have you back on the show. Okay, thank you so much. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for listening today. And as always, keep making history and keep listening. <laughs>